I'm gonna start rolling here. <laughs> I'm also gonna start rolling here. Is that unprofessional? Maybe. No, I think it's yeah. Uh, What's up? Character. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's on brand. <laughs> yeah. What's up, ladies, gentlemen, people of all kinds? Welcome back to another episode of The, the Get, Get Down. Down. Yes. <laughs> Oh, it feels so good to be back. This is our first episode of 2022. <laughs> Hopefully, this year's better than the last three. Yeah. It wouldn't take much either, so. No. Baby <laughs> We're sex. counting on you, 2022. Yeah. All right. So, you know I'm Paulo. You know that's Frantic. Hello. And today we have a very special guest. Yeah, yeah I'm Rana. That's my name. That's Rana. Yeah. Hey. Yes. That's what they call me. <laughs> Rana is... A friend. We haven't seen each other in a long time. Yeah, it's been a bit. Up until recently. Yeah. I but was... we've been reconnecting, and it feels yeah. good to do so. Yeah, it does, man. Yeah. Yeah. So for a while, you were over in India. Yeah, a while, man. I was based out of Delhi for the better part of the past 10 years. And yeah. what were you doing over there? Uh, well, I first went to India as, a, as an economist, which is what my training is. But over the past 10 years, I moved more into uh, filmmaking initially um, with this artist that I was working with. But the reason I was working with them was to actually make a film. So yeah. the short answer to your question, this is a far longer version yeah. of this, but the short answer is that I um, made a film about this guy, Charanjit Singh, but to make that film I had to manage him and handle his booking. And that kind of threw me into this weird world of the music biz. Yes. Yeah. Which then ultimately led to me creating the agency representing a bunch of talent in India. And then finally, over the past uh, four years up to March 2020, uh, producing events Yeah. all over India, but also in the States and Europe and different places. But um, the common thread was to, I think you will relate to this, both of you, is to kind of showcase talent that just wouldn't have a chance to do the thing otherwise because of yeah. Uh, Gatekeepers sure. and bad taste. And yeah. yeah, which there's a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that is a mutual goal I think that so, we share. Sure, yeah. That is like... That's how we know each other. Yeah. Really. That is how we music know. and like trying to do stuff. Yes. Facing like mediocrity. Yeah. And, and we also had a good introduction from a mutual friend. We did, yeah. Yeah, and that, that always helps. Yeah, it does, yeah. The networking. Yeah. And you know, when people think like, oh, this person's doing this and this person's doing this. And just have the thought of like, oh, I should put these people together. Yeah, and it's the kind of thing that people should do more often. Some people are kind of, I don't know, almost scared of it sometimes, I feel like. Because yeah. they don't want to be like responsible for they like... They want to keep their people <laughs> in their you know? pocket. You know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is like... Yeah, part um, of it's that. Uh, you want to keep the resource for yourself. The other reason is... Sometimes if you introduce people and the relationship goes sour, yeah. then, then everybody's like, well, why the fuck did you introduce me to this person? <laughs> yeah, but you know, you can't like... But anyway. that's just a risk you take in life. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, everything is sometimes kind of calculated. Sometimes people that pick their noses are really talented. Yeah. But sometimes people don't like nose pickers. I'm definitely yeah. one yeah. of those people. <laughs> yeah. Talented and not talented <laughs> nose picker. Yeah. yeah. But, you know. So, the transition from economist into the music business. Yeah. Sorry, I'm looking at this. Yeah, I know. I'm <laughs> I was looking at it too. Sorry. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah. it was uh it was kind of coincidental. Uh -huh. Like it wasn't yeah. something <laughs> you in planned on. Like you've always loved music. Yeah. Was it always something that you thought that you'd be involved in on uh, like on a business level? No, never. I think um Ever since I was a kid, I think I always had this fantasy of like, like running a label. I remember when I was a kid in, in like school, in the back of my binder, I would like, I had this label that I pretended I had, and I would like make these album covers and write down the track list and That's all this. Right. I just did this you know, when I was a kid, but it was more just like you're a kid, right? Um, but honestly, like, it, it started with CKDU. If I really start to look back, mm. yeah, when I was like, if you dig this, so when I first moved to Halifax and I was like 14, uh, there was. Well, the number one thing is first I like discovered CKDU. My mind was like, holy, like this is amazing. Yeah. Can we swear? I don't know. If yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I don't want to like. Anyway, oh, so yeah. okay, good. so and I, I moved here and there was a rap show. And I think it was on either Wednesdays or Thursdays or Sundays on CKDU in the afternoon. I can't remember. This is before 
uh, DJ Critical. This the dude before Rich Fry who's doing the hip hop show at CKU. I don't remember his name. Um, but in any case, it was September 1989, so I'm like a bit older. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he, the guy on the show was like, okay, so Run DMC's playing at the Flamingo. We got tickets. If you can call, what, 494-2487, I think was the number? CKD. Really? Yeah, if you can call with the answer to who produced Raising Hell, you get tickets. So I was like, oh shit, it's Russell Simmons. So I called the number and I was like, hey, uh, it's Russell Simmons. So I'm like, congratulations, you won tickets to see Run DMC, so I'm like, what the fuck? So I go. That's dope. Yeah, CKD so I, must have more funding back then. <laughs> yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So I, I go to the studios, and I don't think they're expecting to see this like 14 year old kid with like literally tape on his glasses here and pants oh, that are a bit too short. Tape I was like fully <laughs> like just like the archetype of like the nerd. You know? Maybe I still am, but like yeah. that was me. And they look at me like, who the fuck is this kid? Like what? But they were kind of smiling. They were like, okay. So like, hey, so we always need volunteers here. Maybe you want to. Think about it, like for instance, that the record stacks have to be alphabetized because people pull them out of stacks and dump them for the shows and they leave. It always has to be kept in A to Z. So I was like, okay. So that literally for the next like three years of my life over high school, every weekend I was at CKDU. And the guy was like, there's a tape deck there, there's a record player there, go nuts. And for the next three years, that was like this parallel education into like music mm. where I just like, and it's a college radio station, so it's all stuff that like isn't on the majors for the most part, you know? So yeah. the stuff that you know, and that really kind of formed my whole musical. That's funny. Taste. So I think, you know, to answer your question, like, no, but that was just because I love music. Mm. And it was only much later when I like Well, it's strange. So my father, like, he like I grew up with film in the house, like, you know, photographic film. Mm. My father was like an amateur hobbyist photographer. But I always grew up with cameras. And uh, and he also had like an eight millimeter like film camera, you know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we would like show we would show these like films, like you know, like a family night thing. We watch yeah, these yeah. films, and they're all stuff that my father took from like the sixties, and just like him, just having a camera and do, doing stuff. And I think it left an impression on me. But For anyway, sure. yeah. When I was like mm, after I finished my masters, I ended up going to India to work with um, the UN actually as like a like an intern, and yeah. I was also finishing my masters. And I did that, and it was all math, and it was like, kind of, like it was interesting to me at the time, but it was all about decision-making processes, like amongst farmers. And I hadn't yeah. set foot like on a farm. Yeah. And I was like, I'm full of shit. What the fuck? What is this? <laughs> like, what am I doing with my life? Like, this is just a mathematical estimation of some question. So I wanted to go back. Which is what a lot of that kind of stuff. It can is. be, and it was my first taste into like, okay, so empirical research is interesting, but like, if you don't have mm. a a true understanding of what's happening on the ground. Like, what, what are you doing? Like, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I essentially wanted to do that. So I got a grant uh, from this place in Ottawa to do that, uh, a place called IDRC. They do like, they fund research in developing countries. They're kind of like a Crown Corporation. Yeah. Anyway, so, and I had a mentor over that year and that mentor suggested, have you ever thought about using a video camera? And I hadn't. So suddenly when I was there in the field with, these farmers, I was like taping all these interviews. Yes. Yeah. And you can, you know, reference that and all like, of that you stuff, know, from, yeah. from directly from the people that, you know, your work is kind of impacting. Yeah, it was like at the time it was more a tool just to, for my research, you know. But then what happened is that I came back uh, to Ottawa in the middle to like, you know, do some writing essentially. Mm. And uh, one of the guys where I was working, he's, there was like this. Uh, I don't know, some Pentium, I don't remember, right? This is like 2003. <laughs> One of those like beige boxes, you know? Yeah. And uh, it had Adobe Premiere 6.5. And I had no idea that that even existed, like that you could edit video on a computer. I always thought it was this thing, and this like room with a bunch yeah, of knobs. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, like it just, I, you know, I'm watching TV or movies. Yeah, I'm seeing, yeah. You know, I had no idea. like uh, the, what do they call them? The... At a the dark room. room. Well, for I don't know, like a <laughs> studio thing with lots of gear that I yeah. just didn't have, and I'd never seen one before. And then suddenly, I was like, I can do this on a computer. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up like cutting that footage and showing it to them, um, in the form of a ten-minute short film that I made about my research. And they had no idea that I was doing this. And I showed it to them. They're like, "What the hell? Like, how did you do this?" They were really like happy. Mm. They then hired me as a consultant for the next nine years to document all of their projects all over the world. And that's when I started to like, like learn how to shoot and cut video. That's really cool. But like doing it for these guys. Yeah. And I never thought I would do that. And 
I thought I was going to be an economist, a professor, or something like that. But suddenly, I found this like mm. deep level of satisfaction of using a camera and telling stories, and it you know, blew my mind basically. Well, it's really interesting because it kind of goes to show how sometimes life will take you to where you need to be. Yeah, something sometimes. Like Just no, I had no idea. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. you were doing what you were doing for work. Yeah. And through that, you know, you had this idea of documenting. You know the interviews, mm. and then that led to a gig for nine years. Yeah, but kind I, of doing that. Yeah, you know yeah, what totally. I mean? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I think at the towards the end of that, I was like, but you know, I don't want to not like finish this vision that I had for like my research. So I did a PhD to kind of like because I always wanted to do that. Yeah, and I was still doing the video stuff to pay the bills, but that's when the music stuff started, and it started with this like. This band called uh, called the Black Lips. This band from Atlanta, yeah. Georgia. Uh, I'm not familiar. They're kind of like, like, like um, there was like a scene in the I guess the early two well mid 2000s like uh, Deer Hunter, Black Lips, Carbonas, a bunch, a bunch of bands from Atlanta, kind of garage punk. Okay. But the Black Lips at the time were this band that would be like kind of vomiting on stage and like drinking their own pee and just like outrageous yeah, like, yeah. nonsense, just basically. Kind of crazy shit. <laughs> and uh, and this was yeah and this was like I and I, but I like the music but I also kind of was like okay that's okay and uh, because my like my PhD was on like risk and decision making I started like making these connections between what well, could I bring like this this band to India like what would happen if I tried and tried to get sponsors to like fund the whole thing with that work and so I just put it out I had like a blog or something a blog spot at the time and I just like typed a message and uh, the guitar, Jared, he wrote back and he's like, yeah, I'd love to come to India. And so we started and uh, over like a year I ended up, they were, I don't know if they still are, they were assigned to Vice Records. I don't even know if Vice Records still exists, but as a record label. But it must. They were, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, they were assigned to Vice, so Vice ended up producing this like short film about them in India and I shot it. And this is like early days of Vice doing video stuff. Hmm. But that happened and uh, and of course, you know, well, I don't know, the what happened on camera was, I mean, kind of ridiculous. They got kicked out of the country, long story short. Yeah. <laughs> they, well, they had to leave. They didn't get kicked out. They had to leave because cops because and the Because the authorities and, and... Well, they like yeah. started, they just did their, like a show, the dude was playing guitar with the dick. And it just was like, it became a thing where like, there was like indecency concerns and uh, anyway, so... Yeah, well, I'm, I feel India is probably quite strict yeah. on those things. <sighs> yeah, but it was... Um, I don't think anybody really knew what was going to happen, but anyway, so, but that's what happened. <laughs> and, um, and that, that's what kind of was like, oh, wow, there's this, like, it was really, it was a new thing for me because like, I've been doing video stuff, but like for clients, you know, mm. as a consultant and like, it was lucrative and it was great, but this was like a whole other thing where I was like, I kind of made a story based on a thought happen and then I got a producer and then it came out and it was done. And I was just like, okay, that. It's also a thing that can happen where I don't just have to rely on, um, you know, doing this commercial work with this camera. I can maybe do yeah. other things. I never really thought about mm. it. So basically, that's the, that was a catalyst. And then the gentleman in India, I heard this record. And I was like, what, the, what is this? And then I want to make this story about him. But then I started, like, to do that, like I said, to start booking him. And then suddenly it was, like, I was 10,000 capacity festival stages. And I was managing this guy's travel and his visas. And then the U.S. and MoMA and PS1, you know, he played that and stuff. Yeah. And so... It just got like this thing really fast. How did you guys become acquainted? I heard his record and I literally was like, how do I find this guy? And I did. And he was 72 when I found him. No shit. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's whole, that's the whole thing, which is just ridiculous. Again, this like story, like what is this fairy tale, electronic music dude? What, how does this even? So I, I just was, I felt compelled, but, but anyway, finally to kind of answer your question, like uh, with that background, that's why I started to produce events because he was his character. He just was like completely committed to like a vision artistically. Mm. And he just sent me too when he finally was like getting recognition for this, you know, this record. It's called Ten Ragas to a Disco Beat. This record, mm. you should check it out. When he finally started getting re recognized for this record, performing live, it was like so inspiring to me. Like, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, if you stick to that vision long enough, screw everybody else, believe in it. Like, you know, yeah. it was just really inspiring yeah. for me, and it really kind of 
um, informed what I want to do with my life. Yeah. No. I so in terms of like uh, documenting that, would you? Yeah. Did you like take more of a back seat, or being a manager kind of made you kind of control the environment a bit, like? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, we, we were faced with lots of options as well as when you're like booking shows in terms of where and how and what, but also logistics and how that has to work. But as but yeah, I was doing like two roles. I was on the one hand doing like the nuts and bolts of making the shows happen. I mean, I wasn't the promoter. I was just kind of managing. But there's a whole other stuff, whole other group of people obviously making the shows happen. Yeah. But um, but I was also documenting the whole thing with like a camera. <laughs> so I was like on double duty all the time. Yeah. But that was like really a really buzzy. Yeah, you should, just, you should just wear a GoPro hat. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it's funny also, like, when you're involved in events or things on multiple levels, it's really hard to keep track of it all sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. But I liked it. I liked juggling, like a, like, a bunch of different balls in the air at any given point in time. It was just really exciting. And I think also, like, just... Um, for me also it was really rewarding because mm. what was happening is that people were like okay well you know we have no idea what's happening with contemporary music in india right now maybe you do okay, maybe we should like talk and then suddenly i just you know speaking of connections and all these things like i suddenly had like a bunch of pr connections label connections and mm -hmm. like booking agents and press and all that stuff that you need to do as a manager you know to actually get the artist out there um it sure. started happening so that's why i started the agency because like well now i i do know like most of my peers in india they're musicians and they're kind mm. of left to center but doing some really cool stuff so yeah yeah that's kind of and now by accident now you know, now you're based here yeah i came back i came back uh three months ago mm. almost three months ago because uh yeah just a change it was getting like i don't know i got into a point in india where um i could have stayed but like it was it was rewarding because what ended up happening in the past the last three years was that I started to finally get back to the video stuff after like producing events. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of started with this thing on Netflix. I think I mentioned it to you. Yeah. Yeah. This this like episode of the series called The Creative Indians that they did on me, which are where I, and I they ended up asking me to edit it, which was like unexpected. But because I had all the footage, because I'd shot all a bunch of the footage of all the events, mm -hmm. I did, and that kind of was a catalyst for me thinking again about oh right maybe it's now finally time to like tell these stories so that thing happened and then i finally cut the thing on this that artist strategy i got a commission from from google to do it and then i spent the past like two or three years just like um finally editing and and telling a bunch of stories and i think the lockdown also kind of contributed to that but um yeah it's like i'm here now like looking at starting a new chapter where everything that i've done especially the more the storytelling stuff Mm -hmm. um, that like that is something I want to try here and just see you know what's going on yeah yeah because yeah. I mean I grew up here I guess starting from like I think something like, who's calling you I think calling you oh me maybe okay <laughs> it's possible. It? Um, what's cool is though you're over here you're starting your new chapter yeah but because you know of the technology we have yeah. You can still operate and continue your work in India. I can. Remotely. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the great things that happened is that over the course of doing like, I don't know, 300 events or something like that over like four years is that this is a crew of people who are in most cities who are like down to help out. Now, of course, there's COVID right now, so I'm not doing anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's been the past years. But that's also been speaking, you know, talking about new chapters. Like, I think March 2020 is when I started to like, really um dig into live streaming but in a way that like i wanted to do it which was based on multiple camera angles using phones and having yeah. a server and doing it remotely from anywhere in the world mm. so yeah that was basically what i've been doing all locked on and mm. then that's kind of opened up this other weird new chapter which is what i want to try here you know yeah and yeah. that's something that we're gonna work on i'm pretty excited about yeah. that too yeah I mean, it's just it's just different i don't see a lot of like um I mean, I have a certain idea for the production value of these live streams and what they'll look like, and I don't see it as often as I'd like. Yes. So yeah. it's something I'm just excited about and I want to try. Yeah, I, I feel like you, I don't want to say perfectionist, but you want... you I'm picky. Well, yeah. I'm and, and, you know, as you should be, right? Because your work represents... Yeah. You, like, that, your work is your commodity with what we do, right? Yeah. 
So. Your signature. Exactly. You yeah. know, you yeah, don't want to. If be... something looks good and sounds good, you're more likely to get someone's attention and keep someone's attention. Especially these days. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Where it's there's like... such an oversaturated market. Yeah. That you have to make sure your content. Yeah. Stands out. Yeah. 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 It's highly yeah. competitive, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But also like how you do it and how you like treat it, you know, as like a as like a, a live stream, you know. It's one thing just to turn on your webcam and, and jam out. That's great. Yeah. But it's another thing to like kind of think about parameters and maybe certain barriers and challenges and kind of almost like gamifying it a little bit. Yeah. Thinking more of it yeah. like episodically, like what is the thing that connects all these things together and those kinds of things. Storytelling tools basically. Yeah. Well people like People like com drama or competition, yeah, right? Yeah. And people like having somebody to cheer for or root against. All that, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I do, like, yeah. And creating that sense of investment in like actually caring about what happens to these people. Yeah. Well, or, it's like, or how they how they do. Yeah. I don't know. No, it's true. It's I think you know we were talking on the phone one day. And I think one of the things that I took about took away from doing a lot of the live streams that I was doing, which were like you know kind of weird. Like some of them were like these bizarre talk shows. Some of them were like these performance art pieces where you know unknown things would be happening also to them that they weren't prepared for. But it basically like you, I felt ultimately that it all comes down to vulnerability, and that's why live streaming is distinct from any other form of the moving image because yes. it's that vulnerability that you're drawn to because yes. it, it mirrors your own uncertainty of your own mortality I mean, that's, yeah it's, it's a very maybe a bit of a reach philosophically but like i really do no, think like but that's it's yeah. true because yeah. you know it's like why going to see a play is more exciting than watching a movie because yeah. the movie's been recorded yeah you know what i mean or or watching a basketball game live Versus watching the highlights after you already know who yeah. won. Do you know what it's I mean? It's also a good way of like documenting process. It is. Which is like in terms of like artistry, a lot of like you just kind of get the finished product, but you can kind of see the the journey and the quest like of how you yeah. got to like, you know, that final piece of art or whatever, you know. Yeah. 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 And I think it's one of those lines between what is scripted, what's not scripted, what's fictional, what's not, you know. Yeah. That's where things had interest. A lot of it, like I, when I was... I went, I was living in Copenhagen for a bit and I went to see this like play, but it was this four month long play. It was, a yeah, 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 yeah. So basically uh, Marquis de Sade, uh, if you've heard of this guy, I'm sure you have. I yeah. have. Sadism, for instance, yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. him. <laughs> uh, okay. So he has he this. He coined the term. Like, well, it's a sadist, surname. Yeah. yeah, like. Okay. Because yeah. he's kind of, well, he, he's written a number of books. But one of them is, uh, is called <laughs> Salo, Salo, S-A-L-O, 180 Days of. Sodom, I think it's called. Anyway, <laughs> and, uh, I like this guy already. <laughs> and the movie's awful. I think Piero Paolo Pasolini did the movie. It's disgusting. But anyway, um, this thing was like it was a four-month play treatment of the book, and you go to this place. And no, sorry, there's a reason why I'm explaining this to you. So just bear with me. But like, no, 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 I'm with you. You walk into the thing, and there's like X number of people with you who are all there. There's like timings. You know, you come at seven, mm -hmm. eight, whatever, and they sit you down, and they they hand out like a box with like these. Squares and this yellow, red, blue, maybe green. I don't remember. And you pick one, and there's like uh, I think there's like four of each, so sixteen. Um, in the book, there's like four kind of characters. Well, as he's treated, as a playwright treated this, and there were like the madams, the old dudes. I can't remember the children and the fuckers. And I remember I picked like the old dudes card. So. Okay, so I walk in and this guy approaches me and he's like, so what's your thing? It's like, oh, okay, you're with me. And so they kind of take you in depending on what cohort you belong to. And I was with the old dude. So basically I walk into a room and he sits me down and there's this like young lady and she starts really aggressively hitting on me. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what's going on here. And then like this other old dude comes, just grabs her by the hair and like smacks her ass and like, just, like, it was just, like and just throws her. It's just like, what the fuck is going on? Like what? <laughs> yeah, because I didn't understand it, and he was laughing at her. And then like he and I leave the room, and then we walk down the hallway, and he grabs this other kid and like throws him down on the ground. She starts pissing on him. What? The yeah, what the fuck? Shit? Exactly. I'm like, what's going on here? I don't understand. 
But you could also trade these. these. This doesn't sound like a play. No. Well, that's the thing. I didn't know what was going on. And, and that, so you, you, you can trade these little cards. Did so you I traded escape it. from a cult or something? No, no, no. So, so I, I saw a West Side it. Story and it wasn't like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, it was weird. And so I, know, I ended up like trading this card and then I think I like ended up hanging out with the fuckers for a while. But the whole, it was just bizarre. The reason I bring this up is because, like, I didn't know what the hell was going on <laughs> at all. But it was, like, still contained with, like, a, a method, you know? It was very strategically laid out. Like, we need to bring patrons into this space where they have a role to play. They're incentivized on the basis of a character kind of narrative that we're, we've presented to these actors. Because they're all actors. But once we establish this framework, then whatever happens in that will happen organically and naturally. And that's where the performance aspect starts to come. And that really profoundly affected like, so, how I look at You become a character. You could also stay there, by the way. You, you, you could also like, get a room there and, and become a character. Like, it was wide open, you know? It was yeah. just a framework. Well, and some, that's it. some and of these people, people are probably yeah. in, in that shit. You know, well, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I mean, if you, I can, if you can think of anything in the world, somebody's into it. Yeah. yeah. It's a sick fucking world. But yeah, it was, it was it was really like it left an impression. But on me. I'll say that. One that's right well, yeah. Just there's in terms some, of how to like set up these. There's something about being jarred. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, it's like why you can't look away from a car crash. Yeah. Know, type thing. Like what you were talking about, a representation of your mortality yeah. or your own fears. It's like what like we like watching UFC fights because you want like the idea of the adrenaline of being in a fight without having to worry about actually getting the shit kicked out of you. Yeah, there's a passive engagement, but I think it's like the other part of it is that if you can like, if you're watching this stuff and you get involved, and that's what really kind of like you know. And that's what you're, yeah. With the live streams too, with so, chats, yeah, and like, stuff, you can kind of get people to get involved. Well, for me, the gold standard is OnlyFans. Yeah, you take that logic to the extreme. Yeah. You know, I'm not, like, I'm not making any comment on OnlyFans, but just as a, as an interface for a viewer, a patron, to like have directorial agency to tell the person yeah. on the screen what well, to do. Yeah, well, it's almost like interactive. Pay them for that, it's interactive know? porn, right? Yeah, essentially. It's yeah. like, and and you know, or like you know, even if you go to a strip club, you know, there's people that think that they're actually going to develop relationships. <laughs> With yeah. with these women, <laughs> no, it's true. They actually yeah. think like they don't realize. Oh, you're at work. Oh man, she fucking digs. Yeah, me. she digs me, bro. <laughs> like, guys, if you keep throwing them twenties, she's gonna fucking dig you for sure, right? Yeah. But so, it, so, it, yeah. so it's like characters, and then a situation, and yeah. then uh, driving forces that drive that situation. But that's the yeah. thing. Like what you're saying is the interactive thing. Like if people can vote. On like if it's a competition yeah. and people can vote, or like we were talking about, um, you know, com competitive like beat making between two producers. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then having <coughs> having me. the viewers select the samples yeah. that they're gonna use. Yeah. 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 yeah Different yeah. ways yeah. of like yeah. feeling like you are involved. Yeah, and I think that's what's really fun about like from like a I don't know like a producer. Like in the, in the role that I play with these live streams, I'm kind of director and producer because I'm like doing all the tech stuff, but also thinking about the, the kind of like methodology or mm. um, treatment, you know. For instance, like like the two beat makers and the, maybe like feeding words from a chat room so somebody has to freestyle yeah. while they're like contained with an activity of having to like, I don't know, make like a, make like a lasagna or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you basically just load up different like constraints yeah so like you have to do this 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 and this you're live and we're gonna berate you but you know and harass you while yeah, you do yeah, it yeah. But that's so like, that you're stressed out it's like, like, yeah, yeah. i mean that's that's like a bit like no extreme, but that's, but, you that's know, like, like that's the hell's kitchen i don't know like you know like hell's kitchen oh okay or master chef or like eric or Andre any of those has, shows like, it's like you got rappers like do those like yeah yeah what's that like, rapper or something ninja? it is amazing oh like, man i don't know he listen <laughs> Eric Andre had Killer Mike yeah, yeah, that's and the one. Action Bronson on these, like, exercise machines. do, <laughs> a, do a rap battle <laughs> yeah. on treadmill. And they're both real big boys. You know? so Action funny. Bronson's been taking care of himself. I don't yeah. know about Killer Mike. I hope so, though, because I love Killer Mike. Yeah. But 
They're like on the treadmill, right? Walking on the treadmill and trying to rap back. <laughs> They're both just fucking. Like, yeah. Eric Andre is a funny dude. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of it for me, it's like, it's, a, it's so many things. Like, yeah, that's like. It, uh, it, it, I just like these kind of recipe based treatments where there are constraints and it's like I think a lot of it for me comes from uh, this this art move well this art two of them really they, they kind of exist at the same time but one was in Vienna another was in kind of in New York uh, the New York one was called Fluxus and they had different people like Yoko Ono okay was so like there's this kind of funny meme going around about how actually John Lennon broke up Fluxus as opposed to the common one of oh, Yoko yeah, Ono yeah. breaking up the Beatles <laughs> but Fluxus with like a lot of their work was actually especially Yoko Ono who's brilliant you know she doesn't get enough respect as far as I'm concerned as like a performance artist but she would develop these kind of like haiku like set four bullet point treatments of like an art engagement mm. you know participatory with people and you just let people loose in that space and that, that to me was like deeply that really resonated you know um, so yeah it's just it's like that like a lot mm. of a lot of the work is 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 more thinking about these these containers, mm. and then finding people who might suit a certain deployment of one of these treatments, and just letting it happen. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, so I don't know if you just what was that? That means we gotta normally we'll end up shooting two parts of the episode. Okay. That means we're wrapping up this part okay, of yeah. the episode. All right. Uh, fuck. What was I gonna say? <laughs> 